Well, good morning. Welcome to Walden Community Church. My name is David and I'm the pastor here. And for us today, this is Mother's Day. It's Mother's Day. And maybe, maybe you've heard this uh, answer or this phrase before. You know, somebody will say, hey, do you have plans uh, for Mother's Day? This Sunday, or like, what? What are your guys' Mother's Day plans? And someone's response might be, uh, "Yeah, we're not going to do anything because uh, you know those are those are just made-up holidays by the greeting card company or the flower company. You know, they just got together and conspired and made up a holiday to sell more product." You ever heard that before? That <laughs> the greeting card company got together with the flower company and they just made up a holiday. Here's what's wrong with that statement. It's not true. It's not true. Holidays that we refer to as Hallmark holidays, you know the ones like uh, Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, Father's Day, uh, Grandparents' Day, National Son's Day, National Daughter's Day, Boss's Day, Administrative Professionals' Day, Teacher Appreciation Day, Clergy Appreciation Day, which is October 9th, and uh, Graduation Day. You know there's even a second Valentine's Day, kind of? There's another one. There's There's a holiday called Sweetest Day, and it's uh, October 15th. It was started back in 1922. It's a day to share romantic deeds, romantic expressions, and to perform acts of charity and acts of kindness. But the Hallmark Company was founded in 1910, and they have always stood by their statement that they can't take credit for making up any holidays. So where did all of these lesser holidays or these smaller holidays come from? Well, take a wild guess. Probably the same place that came up with Christmas and Easter, (laughs) right? And they came out of the church. For instance, uh, St. Patrick's Day. It's the Feast of St. Patrick. It's a religious celebration. It's held on the 17th of March. It's a day where we remember the patron saint of Ireland. It's a day to go to church and to have a festive meal. Valentine's Day is the Feast of St. Valentine, celebrated on February 14th. It's to celebrate an early uh, church martyr who uh, later became uh, known with romance and marriage and love. What about Mother's Day? Well, we always think of it as a holiday for little kids, right? Little kids make some sort of paper craft for their mom, and then dad takes the family out to brunch. But the origin comes from a lady named Anna Jarvis. She lived in Philadelphia. Her mother had passed away. And she wanted to do something to remember her mom. See, her mom had uh, organized women's groups to promote fellowship and friendship and health. Anna Jarvis came up with this idea to hold a memorial service at her mother's church in West Virginia, May 12, 1907. And virtually within five years, Every state in the United States was celebrating Mother's Day. And then in 1914, President Woodrow Wilson made it a national holiday. Anna Jarvis wanted to promote the idea of celebrating everyone's mother. And it didn't matter if they had passed on. In fact, she had this little idea of you would wear a red or a pink carnation if your mom was alive, and you'd wear a white carnation if your mom had passed away. Father's Day was founded in Spokane, Washington in 1910 by Sonora Smart Dodd. Her dad was a Civil War veteran. Her dad was a single dad of six kids. And she heard a sermon about Anna Jarvis and her mom at Central Methodist Episcopal Church in 1909. And she told her pastor, I want to have a similar holiday for fathers. So I guess it makes sense that the origin of our holy days would be church, right? But you know another thing I hear every now and then? I've heard people say, 
yeah, yeah, anybody who has studied history knows that Christianity was no more involved in America's founding than any other religion. That's also not true. And sadly, this is where our country is arriving on the subject of truth. And we saw this a lot during COVID. The truth doesn't seem to matter anymore. When Jesus was arrested in John 18, he stood before Pilate. Pilate said, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? That's a good question. But it's also a very easy question to answer. And you don't need to be a philosopher or a theologian. You don't even have to be the son of God to answer it. If you ever have to decide between two choices and you want to know which one is the truth, the truth has no agenda. It just is, right? It just is. And the truth behind our holiday, the truth behind our, na our national heritage is that they were founded by the principles that come out of the Judeo-Christian Bible. And we've always been a biblical nation. It's even printed on our money, right? It's in our Pledge of Allegiance. But would you say that we are a Christian nation? Well, I guess it depends on how you define what being a Christian nation is. I mean, if you, if you say being a Christian nation means that everyone is a Christian, or everyone acts like a Christian, or that all of our national decisions are based on Christian principles, then no, we're not a Christian nation. But if that means that Christianity was the overwhelming faith of our founding fathers, and its influence is seen in our nation's historical documents, and that Christian ethics and morality were accepted as our social rule, our social order, then yes, we are a Christian nation. And anybody who studied history knows Christianity was very much involved in America's founding. But sadly today, there are uninformed people, and they say that our founding fathers were not Christian, even though 52 of the 55 who worked on the Constitution were members of Orthodox churches. So let's look at truth. Let's look at what we know is true. Like, one of the first acts of Congress was to print 20,000 Bibles for the Native Americans. The men who founded our country clearly tied it to Christian principles. In 1799, Justice Samuel Chase said, by our form of government, the Christian religion is the established religion, and all sects and denominations of Christians are placed upon the same equal footing and are equally entitled to protection in their religious liberty. Prior to 1789, many of the states still had constitutional requirements that a man had to be a Christian in order to hold public office. The legislature of New York City in 1838 says this is a Christian nation. Even the Supreme Court in 1892 declared the court's opinion that the United States was a Christian nation. These things can't be debated. These are all facts from history. Anybody can look these up. But we're living in a time of confusion. We're living in a time of misinformation. We perpetuate this lie that Mother's Day, Valentine's Day, Father's Day, they're all fake holidays that's made up by Hallmark. Well, then it, is it any wonder that as a nation, we are also confused as to where God belongs? Because we shouldn't be. I mean, all, we, all it takes is just to look at your money, right? It says very clearly, in God we trust. Money that is printed by the treasury which falls under the executive branch of government. I mean, what are we doing? Where's our nation going? As each year passes 
and we think that we're getting more and more woke, it seems at the same time we're falling more and more asleep. What did our founding fathers fight and die for? What did they lay their lives on the line for? Benjamin Franklin said, gentlemen, we must all hang together or surely we will all hang separately. They were risking their lives for the truths and the ideals and the principles that they believed. Our country's founders knew that the best way to protect religious liberty was to keep it separated from government. So they created the First Amendment to guarantee the separation of church and state. This is a fundamental freedom, and it's the major reason why the U.S. has managed to avoid religious conflicts that have torn so many other nations apart. But every year, less and less people say that they're Christian. In fact, the people who say they're absolutely certain that God exists has dropped sharply from 2007, when it was about 71% of America, to 2014, where it became 63% of America. And the percentages of people who pray every day, go to church, and consider religion to be very important in their lives continues to drop every year. You know, there was a political campaign used a while back that had the phrase, make America great again. But I would argue that to do that, it has nothing to do with who is president, and it has everything to do with God. Common sense would tell us that if we were once a great nation, then we should return to the thing that made us great. Now, we studied Matthew 24 and 25, and during the last days, Jesus promises us that darkness will grow, that Christians will be hated, that persecution will grow. So, it would make us then ask, well, what can we do? What can we do about this? Can we really make a difference? And Jesus says, yes. Jesus says to hang on. He says to persevere. In Matthew 24, he says, many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. See, where the hope for America's greatness is, is here, in the church. The, the church is America's hope. We have to get involved. We have to get more involved. We have to pray for our country, pray for our leaders, pray for our elections, call our congressmen, stand up for what is right, make a vocal voice against what is evil. The Founding Fathers gave us a great nation and they made it very clear that God and Jesus Christ belongs at the front and center of our society. Don't be fooled by so-called enlightened people who think that our holidays were just invented by the greeting card company. The founders knew that when you take God out of something, that something will fall. As Christians, we have to educate ourselves about our national heritage. Psalms 33 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. And look at 2 Chronicles 7.14, and this is where I want to focus for today. It says, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. There's a lot of things that we can see there. But the first thing is, this is for us. Right? This, this passage is for us. It says, my people who are called by my name. These are Christians. All right? And what's the first thing he says we have to do? We have to humble ourselves. We have to humble ourselves and admit that we are sinners. This nation has sinned. We have fallen away from being a great nation that was, that was founded on Christian principles. And, and, and we can say, well, who's to fault? Right? Who's to fault for this? Who's to blame for this? It's other people. Right? It's always other people. We're always so quick to say, oh, it's the left, or oh, it's the right. 
We seem to think that whatever side I'm on is perfect, and it's always my neighbor who is wrong. But the reality is, if the world is becoming less Christian, then it's the Christians who are releasing their grip. They are relaxing, right? So if Second Chronicles says, my people, then this is directed at us. There is no finger to point but back at ourselves. If, if your parents leave you a huge inheritance and, and you spend it all on fast living, whose fault is it that the blessing is gone? It's yours, right? You say, well, the world is so tempting. The world is just so full of distractions. So it's still your fault. The Bible says we have to humble ourselves and admit our sin. If we relax our grip, then we can't complain when the flag starts to move to the other side. When you read your Bible and you watch whenever Israel sins, whenever Israel goes too far off course, right, the first thing they always do is repent and pray. Second Chronicles says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray. Pray how? It doesn't matter. We need to pray. We need to pray. First Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. What does that mean? It means don't stop. Persevere. Earnestly pray. Pray not only for yourselves. Pray for your city. Pray for your state. Pray for your country. Pray for your leaders. Pray for the decisions that they make. Pray specifically by name for your state representatives. And pray that God gives us strength and courage to stand up for what's right to stand up for truth. Not just what's politically correct, but what is biblically correct. The Bible says that God's people, Christians, always pray. In fact, can we just make a, let's just make an unwritten rule right now. I mean, it's not in our church constitution, it doesn't have to be, but we can just, we can just decide right now, right? That whenever we meet together in any sort of smaller group, we should pray. If we meet for men's breakfast or women's Bible study or a you know, small group or a house book club, we should be praying. Whenever we get together, we should pray. Second Chronicles says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face, we should be seeking him continually. First Chronicles 16.11 says, seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. People who love God, people who long for God, seek God. Do you really want what God wants for your life? Do you really want what God wants for your family? Do you really want what God wants for your country? Or do we just want what we want? What's easy? What's fun? Are we being selfish in our desires? Well, look at your schedule. Look at what takes up your time. Look at how much time you spend surfing the internet, or watching TV, or sitting at soccer practice, and then there's fall ball, and then there's baseball, and then there's football, and then there's elections, and then we're building new roads, and then we're building new stores, and then we're always looking forward to the next thing that's coming out. Guess what? None of that matters. None of it matters. The only thing that matters is that we are seeking God continually, longing for the things that God wants in our lives, seeking his face. And then what's the last part of this verse? It says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. In other words, they change direction, right? That's, that's, the, hardest, that's the hardest thing, to change course, to go in the opposite direction of the way you've always gone. I, I don't know that we can do it. Right? Because Jesus promises us 
that in the last days, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. So does that mean that we just give up? No, we, we, we can't do that either. Because Jesus tells us to persevere. Plus, in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the truth, I am the way, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus told Pilate, I am the truth, and, the, and my people listen to my voice. Our, our nation's forefathers fought and died for quality of life. And they fought and died for truth. And they didn't give up. We can't give up. We need to turn from our indifference. We need to turn away from our tolerance. You know, we tolerate the sin in our life. We tolerate the private sin in our life. True repentance is more than talk. True repentance is more than raising awareness. Repentance means change. It is a changed behavior. Second Chronicles says we have to change direction if we want to see change in the world. Whether we sin individually, whether we're sinning as a group, whether we're sinning as a nation. And then what does he say the result will be if we change direction? If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Our land needs that. Our land needs healing. I read a story this week about uh, Benjamin Franklin. Uh, during a meeting of Continental Congress, he noticed that there was an engraving on the chair that sits above George Washington's head. And on the back of his chair, there was an engraving of a sun with radiating lights coming off of it. And Franklin wondered, is that a rising sun or a setting sun? And he wrote later, but now at length I have the happiness to know that it is a rising sun and not a setting sun. The sun was not setting on that newly found nation that was born from adversity, born from war. It was a rising sun. And so as you look ahead, down the road of your own life, down the road of your family's life, your nation's future, what is the road that we have to travel? How should we change direction? What, what, what direction should we face? What is the future that you are willing to persevere for? the future that you are willing to pray for? Is it, a, is it a rising sun or is it a setting sun? See, I believe that we can bask in the warmth of a rising sun once again. And it begins with us reclaiming our national heritage, reclaiming our Christian narrative. What are you going to do for Mother's Day? Well, since it is a Christian holiday, my family and I are going to church. Our attitude has to be the same as Joshua 24. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Which means, you know, it really doesn't matter which way the wind blows. As long as you and yours face God. As long as you and yours walk in the direction of truth. Jesus says, he is the truth and his people listen to to him. That's all that matters. Let's pray. Lord, today we celebrate mothers and we thank you for them. We thank you for the women in our lives that have raised us, whether they be our birth mothers, adoptive, our aunts, our grandmothers. Lord, there were women who cooked us food, who kissed our boo-boos, who helped us with schoolwork, who got us dressed, who welcomed us warmly when we got home from school. Lord, we just Thank you for the role of the mother in this world. And we ask that you are walking with mothers today as they navigate the world and as they raise children in this world. Lord, we just pray that you are with them and giving them strength and letting them know that they are loved and appreciated. Help us to, to walk in the way that you would have us go, to turn from our own private sins, to turn from our tolerance of darkness and to walk towards light and to walk 
and the teachings of your Son. And we ask all of this in the name of his Son. Amen. Well, I hope you have a blessed Mother's Day. And of course, next Sunday, we would love to have you here. We would love to see you. We have two services every Sunday, one at 930, which is our traditional service. We have a choir, and we're going to sing all your favorite hymns. We have a second service at 11, which is where we have our contemporary worship team. And it's a casual service. It's relaxed. Come as you are. It's also where we have a full children's program from preschool all the way through high school. And every Wednesday, we have youth group and it's gonna go all the way through the summer. We don't take any breaks. And so regardless of whether you attend here at our church or not, we would love to see your middle schooler or your high schooler on Wednesdays at six. We will even feed them dinner and we'll send them home to you in about an hour and a half. Hey, we wanna be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week.